Next up, we have our, our next guest is Scott Shanley, the Director of Technical Marketing, SDEC. Hey, come on in. So I brought show toys just in case. Ooh, I like show toys. Hard drives. <laughs> oh, okay. This is uh, Scott Shanley. You're the Director of Technical Marketing, right? This is Scott Shadley. Oh, no worries. Sorry. Everybody pronounces it wrong, so it's not Just a problem. slap me. <laughs> <laughs> not on camera, though. That'll probably get no, yeah, yeah, people upset. So it, it's interesting. My, my last name and the company name both have the same thing in common. Most times, nobody knows how to say either one of them. Oh, so. no. Is it STEC or STEC? <laughs> there you go. There's the question. Yeah, yeah STEC. exactly. STEC, STEC, STEC. Uh, officially, it's STEC, which STEC. Oh, stands yes. for nothing but our stock ticker. So I got it right. Yeah. So it's always entertaining that way. So. so describe your job a little bit and kind of go into detail. Okay. So my job, I'm a director of technical marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, my job is to go out to the world and educate uh, the customer base on what a solid state drive is and what STC does differently than the other companies in the marketplace today. So. Do you feel s still find that people don't know what solid state does? It, it's interesting. There's quite a few people in the in the industry still that don't know what a solid state drive is, let alone what it does. So wow. I, that's why, I, like for example, I brought in Showtoy so I could say, hey, here's what an actual solid state yeah. drive is. Uh, nowadays, we're getting to the point, finally, this year, probably into next year, where it'll be more of, well, which solid-state drive do I want? Why is yours better? What are you doing to make something more unique than the other people? And that's yeah. really where the innovation of the solid-state technology is going today. Okay. So, so um, you guys are a lot younger than I am, but when I <laughs> first started in this business, these things were, like, refrigerator size, right. you know, filled <laughs> with... <laughs> with solid state and they plugged into a mainframe and they were really really expensive yeah. really fast but really expensive really? and but the but the big thing is they they weren't um non-volatile i mean they kind of were right? you had this big battery backup that you could put right on, but they weren't persistent exactly and that's a big change isn't it yeah and it's interesting because non-volatile memory is in the way that it started out as a nor based product and they went to a nan based product they're different uh, internal architectures of the media but it allowed for the the growth of the, the gigabytes while keeping the, the size fairly small. So, uh, But it's also a misnomer that it's truly non-volatile because there are wear out characteristics of SSDs and that's what everybody gets really worried about in the industry. Oh, I hear they're going to wear out too quick. And so those are things that we uh, try to do our best as far as the education front goes to tell people, you know, they yeah. do have a, a finite life to them, but we have ways to predict it, ways to make it manageable. And we've even got technology now where these things are rock solid for five years. So we've eliminated that those concerns for a lot of our customers. Yeah. So. so Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, yes, exactly. Well, I was just going to say, before we get too far into yeah. it, why don't you go ahead and do a little demo and uh, oh, describe sure. and use your, use the toys. Use the toys. So uh, for most people in the marketplace today, I don't know if I can see where this at. This is what we'd call a, a traditional two and a half inch hard drive form factor. Uh, normally you'd see it in anywhere from a, a 9.5 millimeter. Hold it right up there and Mark there will, will catch it. 9.5 millimeter drive versus a 15 millimeter drive. SAS versus uh, SATA, go. those kinds of things. There's different interfaces involved, but we did these little guys to kind of sh do a kind of a show through of what the, there we go, there we go. <laughs> see how the complexity of building these things are. There's multiple PCB layers, there's controllers, there's memory, there's flash. Uh, one thing that we do uniquely is we build everything internally, so I don't know if you can get a good shot on this one, but uh, yeah. this, this way? This guy right here is actually our controller device. We manufactured ourselves, and okay. that's what sets our parts up different from other SSDs in the market. Is we design and manufacture our own controller, the PCB, and all of the hardware that goes with it. The only part of the SSD we don't physically own is the NAND devices, and we have specific partnerships with our customers to satisfy. So, what does that do for you guys, other than help your margins be better? What does it do for your customers? What's the value in you guys designing your own controller? So, the controller is really the key to the solid state technology. It's like the controller is the key to the compellent architecture, the ecologic architecture. How you manage the media is really what's it's important. It's the brains. It's the brains. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, by doing the brains ourselves, we can add layers of complexity or sophistication that help benefit the customers and being able to give them these long term lifetimes. Another unique device we have out, I don't know, you can see this one. This is a huge beast. This is a traditional three and a half inch drive. So you can see the, the progression from three and a half <laughs> yep. to two and a half. And now we've even got the little guy, the 1.8 inch yeah. in comparison. But uh, this guy is actually made of DRAM. So most people say, well, why would you put DRAM in a solid state drive? Because DRAM's not non volatile. Right. We've designed this one so that it runs on DRAM during the operation of the device. But when power goes away, whether planned or unplanned, it backs itself up to flash. So it becomes a non volatile DRAM cache. And it works really good for metadata. What's the ratio? Of, like uh, is it one to one? Can it's really one to one. Yeah. So this, because of the the density differences between DRAM and flash, even though it's this big, it still only holds eight gigabytes, but it gives you a lot of ability to get really fast access data and absolutely no wear out. 
So what are you, what are you learning um, when you guys? I actually wrote a piece when you guys sort of announced yeah. your first OEM. I said, I said, you know, landed a haymaker, right? Because it <laughs> surprised everybody. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like, whoa, you know, solid state's back. And uh, so, what have you learned since then? Because everybody said, oh, disc is dead, and spinning disc is is is, is doomed, and your stock price went crazy, and 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 people calmed down a little bit. Yeah. You know, so take us through sort of what your learnings. From uh, well, your initial launch. So interesting enough, I joined the company right about the time that that, that yeah. major yeah. launch occurred. So I was actually so you're excited. Involved. So that was, was directly involved yeah. with it. So I've, I've oh. sat through the last four years of it. Uh, but really, the idea is. Uh, people need data faster. We, you know, the data transformation they've been talking about here at the show for the last couple of days. Flash media gives you an opportunity to get really fast access to information, but it, it's not going to keep up with the capacity rates of three terabyte drives. It's not going to keep up with the cost points. There's never going to be a true crossover of flash to, to spinning disk. So it really becomes you have to figure out the best way to do the hybrid architectures and make sure that flash mirrors in and, and maps in well with the spinning media. We've never had a, a play in our in our market portfolio that we we're going to say we're kicking spinning disk completely out of the market. It's always been here's how we're going to help augment, make things better, and you know that whole concept of the tier zero, tier one, whatever you want to call it that the SSD fits into. And we make it in every interface, every capacity you can imagine for that purpose because everybody's architectures are unique and different. So you never. say that, but, and, and you know, you're not going to kick, and I, and I understand that's not your strategic plan, but mm -hmm. yeah. isn't that inevitable in certain segments? It's like, you know, the iPod. Yeah. Right? Well, Remember, yeah. The, I used to have a disc in it. I still have one. Uh -huh. I do too. It's, it's so slow to get going. You have to shake it sometimes, <laughs> which is not a good thing to do with disc drives. But, yeah, I uh, find it a little surprising right. that, that you said that. Well, that, so there's different aspects of the model, or of the, the, the space, right? So the consumer space, sure. I mean, there's an, even an article posted earlier today about disk is dead in the consumer market spot. Well, for the iPod, the iPad, for even desktop computers, it's very, very viable because you can get enough memory locally into the system with the flash-based media and get it at a cheap enough price point now with MLC media to make it viable. But in the grand scheme of the large storage arrays where we're getting zettabytes and petabytes and geopites, or I think that's what he put <laughs> up on, geopites, uh, that he put up on the screen there. Oh, that's a new one. You, you have to, yes. you still have to have something that's a larger capacity device to make that really work. And so solid state drive will always be there. It will always increment up with it. It'll grow in the amount of it that you have in a system, but it's never going to be a 100% replacement for it. There are systems that can utilize it that way, and there are industry markets that need to do nothing but solid state, like well, the, the heavy duty stuff, the industrial stuff, things at, like that. At a high level, if you look at the, you know, the big bucket that is spinning discs mm -hmm. today, um, I mean, the, the percentage of, of that bit bucket that is flash or SSD is tiny, right? I mean, it's, it is. It's Today it's very small. Less than 1%? Is and that true? And if you look or? at all, yeah, yeah, pretty much. If you okay. look at the overall scheme of it, but it, even, you know, you look at any of the industry analysts, they're all saying, well, we've got this great little hockey stick about to come up. So everybody, one of the first questions we usually get asked by a lot of the analyst market is, well, you've got a lot of competition on your shirt tails. And it's like, well, number one, it's nice to have them with the target on my back. I'm not shooting at someone else. So competition you know, is good. Competition <laughs> is good. You're doing yes. something that and is And having worthwhile. the competition yeah. that's viable, having two sources in a spot means there's more bites for everybody to get at. So we've, we've done the numbers. We've looked at the market. And yes, it, there's a continued huge spike to take place. Uh, bring in some other guys to help bolster the market, give everybody more confidence that we are knowing what we are doing with the, the technology. And we'll continue to grow together. So do you think... Um, Wherever that, wherever that point is now, let's say it's one percent, right? Just for the sake of argument, do you see that, you know, in growing that that percentage of the total bit bucket, or is it more of play? It's going to stay one percent, but the whole market's going to grow because of the zettabytes and no, I, I think it's beyond that. I think it really is going to be a, a little of both. So you're going to have the continued market growth is going to be huge, but the amount of SSD that you're putting in the system is going to continue to grow. So slowly creeping away. Yeah, whether it be away. by sheer capacity versus number of drives, or whether it be by you know the shrinking technology, the geometries of the flash. Mm -hmm. Uh, we ship today in the Dell Compellent system at 146 gigabytes. We're working with them on their next platform right now. It's a larger capacity, so the bit go up, even though maybe the drive count doesn't, the physical capacity is still increasing in the, in the system. So. And are you able to increase the capacities at the same rate as, uh, as, as spinning disk? Are you a little bit behind, a little bit well, ahead? Or? So if you look at it, even four years ago, we were talking four, eight, 16 gigabyte drives. Right? You know, you're talking the huge monsters, and, but even in this form factor, we're getting them at 4 and 8 gigabytes. We're up to 800 gigabytes today of user space capacity in a drive, and three terabyte uh, spinning disks just came out. So we've made a very large jump to catch up to it. I don't know that we're going to see that, again, that capacity pairing of the devices, but because the geometry shrink and the technologies improve, we can get much closer to high capacity drives very quickly. Yeah, so as an example uh, of encroaching, why would anybody you know, in the next, let's say, two or three years out, buy a, a high spin speed fiber channel? Yeah. 
device that's, you know, I don't know what they are today, 146? 104, I think 300 is the max. 300. Today. Why would anybody buy one of those? I mean, uh, if it, at some point, your price is going to get down there. It doesn't even, does it have to cross over? In other words, does it have to be cheaper? Or no, actually. That if it just gets close enough, yeah. I don't know what that is, 10, 15 percent, people say, I'll take that. Like, because there are, are benefits to it, yeah. so they absolutely. The same would. decisions we're making with laptops. Oh, yeah, like the MacBook Air. It's a little bit more expensive. I don't get as much capacity. Okay, right. I'll go for it. Yeah, exactly. I I bought the Air over the Pro myself, so. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, exactly. It, it's no. You, have, you have to look at it. Yeah, exactly. This is right. true. Uh, but you have to look at the concepts also of where you're going with the market space. So yes, you could get closer on capacity. You're going to get dollar per gigabyte equivalency. Again, you're not likely ever going to get dollar per gigabyte equivalent but look at the overall picture the tco model the roi whatever mm -hmm. you want to call value. it value the wow. value of it right so over here in uh, on the solutions expo we've got a, a demo set up one drive against 24 hdds i get just as much capacity out of it because they're all short stroke to give them their performance play just like they do everywhere else in all the systems and it's faster it's 5x faster so if you put one versus 24 and you do a couple of those you know you get to you very easily come to the point where the dollar value makes perfect sense the dollar per iop the dollar per watt or even like OLTP transactions, the dollar per transaction goes from dollars per transaction to pennies per transaction. So we've got a whole bunch of success stories with many yeah. different people. One of them in uh, Compellent's hometown of Minnesota, the, the Wild, the, the Excel Arena there, put just two drives into their existing Compellent architecture when the SSDs first launched and made it so that their concession stands, the, fat, the slowest part of the concession stand was now the beer tap not the cash registers. Oh, interesting. Because their whole back-end architecture was able to be improved that much just by adding a couple of SSDs. Wow. So that's the, the real value add of these products is we love to displace the entire array. I mean, I'll, you want to give me a purchase order for 7,000 <laughs> drives, I'll take it. But just three or four drives just to give the customer what they really need and making sure that we give them the right amount. So you don't want mm -hmm. to oversell it. You don't need to undersell it. So. I want to go back a second. You you talked about how you know with the SSDs you you have the ability to predict failure. Yeah. Um, can you go into a little bit of detail on that, even on the technical side? Sure. So here's where I'll geek out a little bit. Yes. I, I am the techie guy. Let's go for um, it. So ECC is known. You have to have ECC to correct for data mm -hmm. errors. It corrects up to a certain number of bits of error. We can do 32, 64, whatever you want to call it. But going beyond that, NAND has an inherent wear out characteristic. So it has program erase cycles. There's device physics involved where you're actually wearing down the, the oxide layers, the silicon layers inside the chips, so they can last today, an SLC device lasts 100,000 program race cycles per bit. An MLC lasts 10,000 program race cycles per bit. What you do is you have the ability to know exactly when that 10,000th cycle -ish right. is going to occur, so you can then tell the, the end user, hey, look, my drive's coming close to its end of life. The real potential there is what you can do with that. Can you extend the number of cycles by using proper controller technology? Can you move the data around within the SSD to extend the life of the product? And we have technology we've built into our controllers. Uh, one of them is a proprietary algorithm called CellCare. Okay. Cell because they're individual NAND cells, where we can take an MLC drive at any given capacity and make it last five years. Okay. So you can beat on it all you want. You can rewrite the capacity of the drive 10 times. So if you have a 200 mm. gig drive, two terabytes a day can go in and out of that drive and it'll last for five years. And that's something that we can do with our unique algorithms in the back end of these devices to help promote customer use mode. So they come up and say, well, I hear it only has 3,000 program race cycles. Well, the raw flash, the way it's shipped, has 3,000 program race cycles. Our brains, our controller, can take that 3,000 program race cycles and make it disappear. You can go 50, 60,000 times that to give you those five-year lifetimes. And so, yes, they have predictable failure rates, but we make the predictable failure rates so far wow. out, nobody's going to care about it. Anymore. Well, the key is, there is you do it with software so you don't have to throw a bunch of flash at it. Yeah, so, so that, there's, know, it's, exactly. It's too expensive to do it that way. Yeah, so there's there's all kinds of interesting things. I mean, we, we've been lucky enough to get about 83 patents towards technology in, inside that, these yeah. devices. It's um, good and you, for example, the 146 gig drive had over provision down from a couple of hundred gigabytes. The 200 gig drive we have today is 256 gigabytes. So we do hide a little bit. There's about 50 gig there that we call a. The, what's yeah, been compressing that. It's been termed over provisioning in the industry. Everybody's really doing it now. Any device that comes out that's an enterprise class product has some form of a provision space, right. and that also helps add to the speed capabilities of the devices. Oh, uh, sorry. I thought you had a follow-up, but um, <laughs> sorry, so, I was drinking some water. <laughs> I, um, I, I wanted to talk to you, Scott, about the whole storage hierarchy. So there's a scenario out there that says, "All right, we're going to have flash," and then what I called before the bit bucket, just yeah. you know, deep, cheap and deep. Right. Um, do you guys subscribe to that, or what? Are you, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, we actually 
it, it, the tiering model is, is very sound. We've got products that fit into every aspect of the tiering model and we figure out how to work with our customers about which what plan they have for the system. So if you're doing a, a system today that's 15K as your high performance tier, 10K and then you know SATA spinners for your bulk storage, we can either replace the 15K tier or we can augment the 15K tier. I've actually got a, a breakout session tomorrow where I'll be actually putting up an, an ROI model and showing the actual cost difference. By putting the, SSD, the more expensive SSD in the box, the overall cost of the IT user is still less, and the value add and the performance. Yeah, I believe that. And so, but but your answer was very politically correct. You're just saying yeah. basically whatever the OEM wants to do, we support, <laughs> no, no. right? But with, with multiple tiers. But so so or, or are you saying no? We see that it's going to be multiple layers. That, it, it, that, that it's there's be value. Multiple layers. In that. Yeah. Okay. And there is significant value because I mean, I can give you an 800 gigabyte SSD today, and mm -hmm. you can put a whole bunch of 800 gigabytes in there to give you your bulk storage. But the controllers, the back end of the, the overall system can't manage the performance that you're going to get from that many drives. One of the early problems we ran into with the first launch of the products was the, the controllers that were running the RAID groups or the expanders, they couldn't handle the bandwidth we were pushing out to because they never expected to see that level of I.O. come off yeah. of a, of a JBOT or any kind of architecture. So, I, I, by the way, personally, I think you're probably right because you can't just replace all those tiers yeah, over, exactly. overnight. But the, the follow-up I had to that is there's granularity now in the I.O. stack where you're seeing you guys generally connect into uh, an array. Uh, you're seeing people do PCIe and you're seeing stuff in between. Yeah. You know, flash on controller and you're seeing you know, all, all kinds of software. So what do, you, what do you see happening there? And is that an opportunity for STC? Uh, absolutely, that's one reason why even today we have so many options available to our customers is interface choice, how much you want, where you want to put it, how fast you want it to be, which flash technology do you want it to be moving forward, because we now can support SLC and MLC in enterprise class environments. So by doing that, yeah, you can you can put it where you would like to put it. We've got solutions that work as you know from the hot pluggable front end to the mount in the back. We've even got little small embedded devices that go in the back end of a 1U chassis. So you take out the you know smallest hard drive you can get today, which is a 40 gig boot drive put in a, a simple small SSD, takes up half the space, you can now cram in more controllers, you can cram in more DRAM, whatever you need to on that smaller chassis, or go for the big box and put one of these guys in and get your bulk storage and your performance. So the in. former was a, was still emulating a, a spinning device or, or no? They all, yeah, they're all yeah, emulating. Right. And then okay. you have the move to things like PCIe architectures where you can get the PCIe interface, but Will you there's play still there caveats or? there. We, we are in the process of getting something there. Uh, it was announced by our CEO during our last earnings call that a PCIe project is in the works. But there's trouble there too. So there's already players in the market. They do things very uniquely. Some Fusion of them are very IPO software is, based. Uh, yeah. Coming this week, and then exactly. some violin just raised a bunch more dough. Exactly. So they they have their unique arc. violins a, a, a box. Fusion IO has a software centric device. So they have a lot of middleware they put on their systems for it. So how do you build a solution that makes the most sense for all your customers? And then what interface do you use? Because you can have that PCIe now that it's. PCIe, it's not really talking protocol like a drive would. Do you put a drive protocol in front of it? Do you put a, a NAND flash interface protocol? Well, they say, so Scott, the best I.O. is right. no I.O., exactly. so maybe you don't. <laughs> but, 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 um, but no, that, to the point, that really, is, I wanted to have a discussion about the, the increasing granularity of that side of the I.O. stack, and so you're actually seeing the hierarchy become more complicated, not, exactly. not simpler. So I, I don't necessarily subscribe to that flash bit bucket because I see it just being very granular for a lot of different use cases. Oh, and it, it's it'll fit in a lot of different places again because of its architecture, the way it's built, and how you can access it, and how small it is compared to mm -hmm. what you're used to traditional rotating media or the cost of DRAM versus the cost of flash. It has a lot more applications, and it will see a lot more growth in the more off segments that you call it, like the controller level architectures, the PCIe architectures. And so it's just a matter of how the OEMs choose to use it and utilize it. And you can produce a product and ask them to use it your way, or you can talk to them and make sure the product does exactly what they need it to. And our, our goal has always been, as the OEM company that we are, is to make sure we provide the product the customer needs, not provide a product and ask them to try to fit it into their you know, square peg round hole kind of thing. So new form factors, uh, a, a, P, a PCIe statement of direction, what else is on the to-do list, or is that going to keep you busy for the next? Well, that'll keep us busy for a while, but what, well, what, what comes next is, okay, so geometries are getting smaller, reliability is getting worse. What happens when you hit the theoretical you know, beyond the theoretical of Moore's Law, what's the next technology? So you've got all kinds of new architectures that are coming out. Didn't Michael talk about something like that? Yeah, some, he, he was a... Uh, some gaseous <laughs> storage technology. <laughs> oh, no. Exactly. Uh -huh. So you've got phase change memory, you've got 3D NAND, you've got all these other things. We've got a whole oh, slew of engineers that are already doing, dealing with and working with those, all, those, all those types of devices today. So Got your best people on it. We do. Uh, we, we've yeah. got 
I mean, my former experience as a semiconductor guy, I used to de design NAND chips. So Where was that? 